Number five, 54 hands. In cartoons, you know, Tom and Jerry, Looney Tunes, that kind of thing, they're always fishing out stock garbage, like a fish skeleton or maybe a boot. And I always thought that was pretty funny. You know, imagine pulling up just a totally random thing out of the water. I imagine it's a lot less funny in real life though, pulling up severed body parts or 54 severed body parts, you know, kind of like pieces of a terrible puzzle. In 2018, fishermen in the Beshenyet channel of the Amur River made a horrifying discovery when they fished up a bag containing 54 severed human hands. I think we can all agree that's probably one of the worst things ever that you could probably fish up. That's got to be very low at the bottom. At first they pulled up a single hand and that would have been enough to make this list and then the fishermen shortly pulled up 53 other severed hands in a little sack. <laughs> Someone out there is missing a collection, clearly. Now, I don't know a ton about Siberia's wildlife, but severed hands aren't indigenous to Siberia's rivers and lakes, meaning someone put them here. Investigators gave no clues as to who the hands might have belonged to at one point or why they were all discarded in this manner. The hands were wrapped in plastic shoe covers and bandages, and police took fingerprints from the hands to see if maybe they could be traced, maybe they could get some back to their owners. Now, theories about why 54 severed hands in a bag washed up have unsurprisingly prompted a lot of wild speculation. I mean, really, you can kind of take your pick where you want to go with this. Severed as part of some punishment of a, a crime syndicate, a lone lunatic with a collection, some sort of demonic satanic ritual, or is it something deeply macabre but explainable? Now, a prevailing theory from local police is that the hands came from a medical scenario, and that means amputations, cadavers, students does not nearly begin to explain how 54 of them ended up in a bag and then in the river though and to think they'd probably still be there if it wasn't the right hook at the right time weird thing to think about and if you're looking for way more videos about scary sea creatures they don't all have to be hands we got loads and loads more on the channel we love freaky stuff deep beneath the water so click through Hit subscribe, make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a video, but if you wouldn't mind, do that at the end of this video, because I got four more freaky things found on the fishing lines coming up for you right now. Coming in at the number four spot is this terrifying 16 foot long monstrosity hauled out of the ocean by Chilean fishermen. Shocking those who learned suddenly that fish can be five meters long sometimes. A clip of the oarfish was posted to TikTok where it went viral almost immediately. Little fishy fever sweeping up 10 million views. Most people worried this fish might be a bringer of bad times and there might be an inkling of truth to that. The fish is called an oar fish and it's thought to be an omen of impending bad fortune which I understand completely. If I was having a nice day on the water and I pulled this thing out, I would not think that I had been blessed. I would not think that good things were about to happen to me. In Japanese folklore, this fish is sometimes referred to as Ryogo no Tsukai, translating the messenger from the sea god's palace. Linked to the legend of Namazu, a giant sea snake which caused earthquakes whenever it would rise. Now, oarfish live deep, deep, deep in the depths of the sea, really way down there. And there's a theory that they only rise nearer to the surface level whenever there's a disturbance of the tectonic plates. That's the big crust that makes all the earthquakes happen, which would definitely make this fish a bad omen and a bringer of earthquakes, and you understand where the folklore behind it would come from. But Here's something for you. The actual oarfish, terrifying as it looks, is a gentle giant. It's the largest bony fish in the whole world, and it isn't much of a predator, so don't worry about it. It looks like it could swoop you up whole. It's not going to. It prefers to swim around hoovering up plankton. They barely even have teeth, actually. And they don't pose a threat to humans at all, unless you consider scaring the heck out of you a threat. And I hope not, otherwise I'd be threatening you guys every single day Day, twice a day. In third place, we have the Mariana Trench. I'm just going to apologize in advance because I know I'll slip up at some point, if not every time, and say Mariana's Trench out of habit. I can't help it. They're my favorite band. Even writing up my points today, I kept adding in the extra S. Feel free to let me know in the comments if you're also a fan. The Mariana Trench is an oceanic trench located in the Western Pacific Ocean, about 200 kilometers east of the Mariana Islands, and it is the deepest oceanic trench on Earth. It's crescent-shaped and measures about 2,550 kilometers in length and 69 kilometers in width. The maximum known depth is roughly over 36,000 feet, plus or minus another 80 feet, which is way too much math for my brain. At the southern end of a 
small slot-shaped valley and its floor known as the Challenger Deep. For reference, if Mount Everest was located at this point in the trench, its peak would still be underwater by more than 2 kilometers. And just remember, that's the world's tallest mountain we're talking about here, not some cute little hike. The Mariana Trench has been a major area of intrigue throughout history, with the trench first being explored during the Challenger Expedition in 1875 using a weighted rope, which recorded a depth of 26,850 feet. In 1877, a map was published titled the Tiefenkarte des Grosses Oceans, or Depth Map of the Great Ocean, for those of us who don't feel like butchering a pronunciation today. Most recently, in 2011, it was announced at the American Geophysical Union Fall Meeting that a U.S. Navy hydrographic ship equipped with a multi-beam echo sounder had conducted a survey which mapped the entire trench to 330 feet resolution. As of 2022, 22 crew to descents and 7 uncrewed descents have been achieved. Some notable discoveries over the years include the 1960 expedition, which claimed to have observed large creatures living at the bottom, such as flatfish that were about 30 centimeters long, and shrimp. In July of 2011, a research expedition deployed untethered landers, or drop cams for those of us that prefer simple English, equipped with digital video cameras and lights to explore this deep sea region. Gigantic single-celled organisms with a size of more than 10 centimeters in diameter, belonging to the class of Monothelamia, were observed. Monothelamia are noteworthy for their size, their extreme abundance on the seafloor, and their role as hosts for a variety of organisms. In December of 2014, a new species of snailfish was discovered at a depth of approximately 26,722 feet, breaking the previous record for the deepest living fish seen on video. During that 2014 expedition, several new species were filmed, including amphipods known as supergiants, bringing us back to that deep water gigantism I talked about earlier. Now, before any of y'all go, but Alexa, why is this scary? Well, it's because it's a constant unknown. Being so large and so deep, something new and creepy is discovered every time people explore its depths. Who knows what's still hiding down there? In second place, we have the blue-ringed octopus. Now, just a little background. An octopus is a soft-bodied, eight-limbed mollusk of the octopoda order that consists of around 300 different species. Like other cephalopods, an octopus is bilaterally symmetric, with two eyes and a beaked mouth at the center point of the eight limbs. The soft body can radically alter its shape, enabling octopuses to squeeze through small gaps. The siphon is used both for respiration and for locomotion by expelling a jet of water. Octopuses have a complex nervous system and excellent sight, and are among the most intelligent and behaviorally diverse of all invertebrates. Octopuses inhabit various regions of the ocean, including coral reefs, pelagic waters, and the seabed. Some live in the intertidal zone and others at abyssal depths. All octopuses are venomous, but only the blue-ringed octopuses are known to be deadly to humans. Ergo, why they're my focus today. This specific species can be found in tide pools and coral reefs in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia, and can be identified by their yellowish skin and characteristic blue and black rings that change color dramatically when threatened. They eat small crustaceans, including crabs, hermit crabs, shrimp, and other small sea animals. Despite their small size, that ranges from 5 to 8 inches in circumference, they are very very dangerous to humans if provoked when handled because their venom contains a powerful neurotoxin tetrodotoxin, which can cause loss of all sensations and paralysis of voluntary muscles, including the diaphragm and intercostal muscles, ergo stopping breathing. The full list of possible side effects from the venom include nausea, heart failure, severe and total paralysis, blindness, and can lead to death within minutes. The blue-ringed octopus carries enough venom to kill 26 adult humans within minutes. I'm just gonna repeat that to be clear, 26 adult humans within minutes. Their bites are tiny and often painless, with many victims not realizing they have been envenomated until respiratory depression and paralysis begins. Oh, and by the way, there is no such thing as blue-ringed octopus antivenom available. And finally, in first place, we have the stonefish. Now, you might be asking, after the deadly octopus and a literal pit in the ocean, how can we get scarier? Welcome to where I almost jumped out of my chair and onto the floor. Stonefish are a family of fish called Cynocidae. They are famous for being the most venomous fish in the world, with a sting that causes excruciating pain in, you guessed it, humans. Their venom is lethal to other marine animals and humans, causing intense pain, breathing problems, damage to the heart, fits, and paralysis. Now, thankfully, unlike the blue-ringed octopus, there is an anti-venom, but if it's not delivered quickly, the effects can be 
fatal. We know of five different species that exist. The midget stonefish, or the Orsinacea alula, Estuarine stonefish, or Sinacea orida, the Red Sea stonefish, or Sinacea nana, the Sinacea platyrrhyncha, and simply the stonefish, or Sinacea verrucos. Look, I tried my best. They hail from the coastal regions of the Indo-Pacific Ocean, so northern Australia, India, the Philippines, and others. Their name comes from their ability to blend in with rocky seafloors and amongst coral, which is what makes them easily stepped on by people and is a good chunk of the danger. They have 13 spines along their backs, which is what delivers the toxin, and at the base of each spine is a venom sac, which is activated under pressure. So, you know, when somebody accidentally steps on them. Now, if that's not terrifying enough for you, because we do have a reputation to uphold here, scientists at the University of Kansas have discovered that stonefish also have a hidden switchblade in their face that they can flick out whenever they feel like they're in danger. They call this bony, blade-like protrusion a lacrimal saber, and it's located on a bone under the fish's eyes. The saber is housed inside the fish's head, and they use their cheek muscles to deploy it. One good thing, at least, is that it's not venomous like their spines. Number five on this list is the whale fish. This fish is like a legendary Pokemon when it comes to how rare it is. Live Science says the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute released footage in August showing a bright orange female whale fish around 6,600 feet deep offshore of Monterey Bay, California. Very little is known about this bizarre fish because of the three drastically different appearances of the juveniles, which are called tape tails, males, which are called big nose fish, and females, which are called whale fish. The three forms look so different that scientists originally thought that they were three different species. This shape-shifting transformation from juvenile to mature females is believed to be one of the most extreme among vertebrates. Whalefish have rarely been seen alive in the deep, so many mysteries remain regarding these remarkable fish. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute tweeted, Let's pull up this image from the Smithsonian that really shows off exactly how weird this fish is. So here we have the three fish, and you can see exactly how different they all are. The Smithsonian says there are other examples of males and females with very different shapes, and of animals changing from one shape to another as they grow older. But this is one of the most amazing examples of sexual dimorphism combined with metamorphosis ever found among vertebrates. So we are talking literally about a super rare, shape-shifting fish that in my opinion looks creepy as all holy hell. I'd say that you can find this beast at the bottom of the ocean but odds are you won't ever even run into it because of how rare it is. We've been exploring the bottom of our oceans for quite some time now, and we are only just starting to learn a little bit about this fish. In all honesty, we really have no idea about it though. Whatever it is or whatever it does, one thing is pretty clear to me though. It's creepy looking, it lives at the bottom of the ocean, and I don't like it. Number four on this list is the goblin shark. This fish has got to be at the top of everyone's lists when it comes to the grossest looking creatures in the world. National Geographic says, Swishing through the deep sea, a goblin shark notices a small, yummy looking squid. The animal inches towards its prey. But as the fish closes in, the snack starts to dart away. So the shark thrusts its jaw three inches out of its mouth. The jaw is connected to three inch long flaps of skin that can unfold from its snout. The predator then grabs the squid in its teeth. After scarfing down the meal, the shark fits its jaw back into its mouth and swims off. That's right guys, a goblin shark's top and bottom teeth are attached to ligaments or bands of skin tissue tucked into its mouth. When prey is just out of reach, the shark extends the elastic tissue out of the mouth to nab the grub. This allows the animal to chow down on snacks such as teleos fish and squid. It also makes the shark one jaw-dropping fish. These disgusting looking creatures like to live right at the bottom of the ocean and are native to the oceans around Japan. There are also some of them off of South Africa and in the ocean water surrounding Portugal. They can grow to be 12 feet long and weigh almost 500 pounds. These aren't monsters, but they may as well be. 
A 500 pound beast with a detachable jaw that looks like a goblin just chilling at the deepest darkest part of the ocean. I truly cannot think of a whole lot of creatures I would rather run into than this freaking thing. Number three, basket star. Now whenever I do these videos about the ocean and all manner of strange monstrosities that live beneath the trenches, I feel like I discover all these new species and more often than not, the species I discover are ones that I probably would have been fine not knowing existed on this earth with me. When I find out for even 50 seconds of these things live on earth, oh, Puts the fear of God into me. Makes me understand that I could die. Look, I like ocean creatures fine enough, but whenever we do these videos, I just think about how they feel, and I can't imagine our next creature would feel pleasant. This horrible little bundle of spaghetti is called a basket star. It's a very ugly looking fish. I'm sorry, basket star. I mean not to pass judgment, it's just that you're ugly. Maybe a basket star came up on your TikTok timeline recently when an angler from Singapore caught the strange creature and posted a video of it, gaining viral traction as we all came to gawk at the weird tentacled creature. The angler, one ramlin same, caught the basket star on one of his usual fishing spots off Pulau Ubin. The creature was writhing and wriggling with what looked like more than a hundred wiggly little appendages. Ugh. It just, it, it looks like all the stuff that collects at the bottom of the sink, you know? <laughs> looks like if you put your finger in that, you'd never get it back. I just don't like looking at it. At the time, he thought at first that it was just a bit of seaweed being pushed around by the waves, and when he pulled it up, he thought that that possibly the creature was an alien, which I totally get. If I pulled this thing out of the water, I would be calling the FBI. Now, while that would have been pretty cool, it's just this freaky little critter. Now, because they're deep sea creatures, it's rare that humans get to see basket stars up close or study them, which is what made Ramlin's catch all that much more interesting. We actually don't know a ton about these bizarre little creatures. But the other thing that made it so interesting is just because, come on, look at how weird this little pile of noodles is. That exists. That exists on the same planet as you. <laughs> Number two, a giant prehistoric skull. Generally, when you're going fishing, the goal is to catch a fish, maybe even two fish if you're getting wild. So imagine the surprise when you find a prehistoric skull on the end of your line. Raymond McElroy, no relation to the podcast Empire, and his assistant Charlie Coyle were shocked to discover a massive heaving elk skull with a gigantic pair of antlers on the other end of their hook. According to scientists who carbon dated it, the skull dates back nearly 11,000 years. Now, shockingly, the water they were fishing in was only about 20 feet deep when they discovered the elk skull. You'd think someone would have tripped over it in 11,000 years or dug it out by now, but hey, fate works in very mysterious ways that I don't claim to understand or try to. I can try to imagine pulling a giant skull out of the water though. Charlie Coyle was shocked by it saying, I thought it was the devil himself. I was gonna throw it back in. I didn't know what to do with it. At the very least, hanging it up as living room decor, man, above the fireplace, above the mantle, it would go great. Now, the skulls and the antlers of the giant elk once belonged to an extinct ancient species known as the Megaloceros giganteus, and I know I'm gonna end up making a bunch of videos about the Megaloceros the way I did the Megalodon and the Titanoboa, it's entirely possible. This species has been extinct for well, nearly 11,000 years and was one of the largest species of deer to ever trot around the world. How it ended up in a lake in Ireland, get caught by a pair of fishermen, kind of above my pay grade, but hey, I don't solve the mysteries here, I just ask them and speculate blindly. And number one, a ghost shark. Oh. Roman Fedorzov routinely entertains his 600,000 Instagram followers with pictures of all the bizarre monstrosities he pulls out of the sea while sailing around Murmansk. That's a port city in Russia. His Instagram is a treasure trove of scary undersea finds. It's one of my favorite things on my feed, and I absolutely recommend you give him a follow on any of his social media platforms if you're into this sort of thing, as he is the head honcho for it. This video could easily have just been five things he posted on his account. Like I said, this guy is the king of weird stuff in the water. Right here is a fish of many names, sometimes called Frankenstein's fish, due to the stitches all over its body looking like it's like sewn together from all these different fish. It's also been referred to as a rat fish, a ghost shark, a spook fish, <laughs> but officially they're known as ghost chimeras. These things are bad news from teeth to tail. They got a spicy door. They do not have a spicy dorsal fin. They might taste amazing, but I doubt it. I mean, look at 
lucky thing. They have a spiny dorsal fin that's poisonous to the touch. It's got a mouth of rat like teeth that helps it grind down anything it catches, crushing its prey in its jaws. Now, it usually goes after delicious things like crabs and prawn, so the rat teeth help pulverize tough shelves. You're not really supposed to eat the shells, but it's a fish. Nobody told it that. It also makes for a very handy nutcracker. Now, these little predators also have an inherent ability to detect the electric fields produced by other creatures. I'm just reading fun facts off a Wikipedia page. I wish I even knew the littlest bit about biology because that makes this fish sound magic. I didn't know fish had like electricity. I should have paid attention in school. Too late. Now I'm here. Now I'm reading YouTube. I could have had a different career. Now, I think as a little treat while I reassess my life and my career path, we ought to have a slideshow of just a bunch of Fedortsov's weirdest catches. We'll do a little lightning round of some freaky sea critters and I'll react to them. We'll have fun. It's gonna be a great way to end the video. We're all gonna laugh. All right, here we go. Ready, ready? Baby, that's, not, that's a face not even mother nature could love. I don't mind this one. I wouldn't touch it, but I like it. I like it, the cut of its jib. I play cards with this one. Buddy, toss that one back in the water. I don't ever want to see that again. Don't ever put that up on my screen again. I don't ever want to see that. Number five on this list is a mistake. So I know that's kind of weird. How do you discover a mistake? Well, in a story from One Dumb Diver, and yeah, that is their actual handle, they do just that. They write, when I was 15, I took the family boat out and dove the reef myself to clear my head. That was mistake number one. I was down at a depth of about 90 feet when I was only rated for 60. While diving, I spotted a three and a half meter mako shark coming right at me. For those who are unaware, makos are basically the cheetahs of the ocean and they only have two speeds. Curious, which is harmless, and lunch. This guy was in lunch mode, so I hovered, as I'd been trained to do since there was no way for me to escape it. Nowadays, we dive with shark shields, which emit electronic pulses that freak the sharks out and keep them away, but back then, what we used was essentially a chainmail sleeve, the idea being that sharks hate the taste of metal, so if you give it your arm, it'll bite down, decide you're gross, and move along. So I wait, and it comes, and I make a perfect move to give it my arm. However, just before the crunch, it occurred to me, that I'd left my sleeve on my bed. I had my knife drawn, however now I had a series of problems. I had a huge open gashing wound on my arm from the bite in open water and trailed blood everywhere. Once the shock wore off, you realize that you're in salt water and salt water and open wounds, they don't feel too good. In a panic, I dropped my weight belt and shot up to the surface without any sort of waiting period. Because I hadn't been paying attention to the currents, I was approximately a quarter mile downstream of my boat, which means I had to swim up to it. So I end up racing back to shore with nothing more than a tourniquet to staunch the bleeding. Long story short, my series of unfortunate self-inflicted events earned me 172 stitches, boatloads of physical therapy because the shark had actually bitten down into my tricep and detached it and easily identifiable scars on one of my arms for the rest of my life. So that story right there folks is why I personally don't think I'm ever going deep sea diving. I love sharks, they're super cool, I love to learn about sharks, but I am more than happy to keep them in a tank at the aquarium and learn about them in that way. Swimming with them or discovering one in front of you on the day that you also forgot your protective gear, not something that sounds like a great time. Number four on this list is a barracuda. El Herrera 9519 writes, one time when my parents visited Mexico, they went diving and my mom was slightly lower down than my dad looking at the ocean floor. My mom had on a gold necklace that was floating in the water around her. It was a sunny day and a fairly shallow dive, so it was sparkling. My mom looked below at all the critters when my dad grabbed her and started frantically shaking her arm to get her attention. She looked up and a barracuda was directly in front of her, staring intently at the shiny necklace. She slowly moved up her hand to cover the necklace and then slowly and calmly moved away from it and it took off without bothering them anymore but still pretty unsettling and taught my mom to be a little bit more aware of her surroundings when diving. So I looked it up and barracudas can grow to be 1.8 meters in length. Pair that with their extremely sharp teeth and the fact that shiny objects remind them of the little silver fish that they eat and you have yourself in a pretty bad situation. The woman in this story is honestly extremely lucky that this fish waited to decide if it was going to attack or not. Most times she wouldn't have had time to respond and it would have just gone to take a bite. Considering this necklace would have been around her neck, having a barracuda bite into it could have ended very badly. Number three on this list is the proboscis worm. I don't care what anyone says, this has to be a monster. 
just based on literally how freaking gross it is. It needs to be qualified as a monster. This species is also known as ribbon worms, and there are actually a ton of ribbon worms in the world. The ones I'm talking about reside deep at the bottom of the ocean. These ones usually grow to be bigger than the other ones in the world. The Smithsonian Magazine says the largest species of ribbon worm is the bootlace worm, which can be found writhing among rocks in the waters of the North Sea. Not only is it the largest Nemertian, but it may also be the longest animal on the planet. Uncertainty remains because these stretchy worms are difficult to accurately measure, but they have been found at lengths of over 30 meters and are believed to even grow as long as 60 meters longer than the blue whale. Despite their length, they are less than an inch around. Now these creatures don't have any natural predators, and let me tell you why. Because they look disgusting. Like, let me ask you guys, would you want to eat that? I would straight up need to be starving and there would literally need to be nothing edible left on the planet other than this thing before I decide to take a bite. It literally looks like a large intestine that just slithers across the bottom of the ocean. Shockingly enough, this is a real thing though and you can find it chilling in deep waters. Number two on this list is zombie worms. We aren't quite done with the worm talk yet guys because now we have got to look at zombie worms. Zombies are a pretty terrifying monster, so are these just like them? The Smithsonian says zombie worms don't crave brains, instead they seek bones. The 1-3 to three inch Ostax worms were first discovered in the bones of a rotting grey whale on the deep sea floor nearly 10,000 feet deep in 2002. Since then, more Osidex species have been discovered. There are 26 according to the World Register of Marine Species. Zombie worms don't eat mineral bones directly, instead they digest fats within the bone. However, their style of eating is quite different from ours because they don't have a mouth or a stomach. They secrete an acid from their skin that dissolves bone, freeing up the fat and protein trapped inside. Then, symbiotic bacteria living in the worm's body digests the fat and protein. How Osidax acquire nutrients from the bacteria isn't known. They may simply digest the bacteria or nutrients are somehow transferred to the worm. They hold on to whatever bones they can find by drilling in with roots which contain the symbiotic bacteria. Zombie worms can retract these plumes into the body when they are disturbed. If all this isn't strange enough, the only worms doing any drilling are female. The microscopic males live inside their bodies. One study counted 111 males inside just one female zombie worm. This eliminates the pesky step of having to search for a mate because the eggs and sperm are right next to each other. Then the worms can disperse many fertilized eggs far and wide, hoping that they land near some recently fallen bones. Needless to say, but these are some weird freaking creatures. No wonder we've nicknamed them zombie worms. They're about as monstrous as you could possibly get. Not to mention, but they feast on the bodies and bones of the dead, similarly to what zombies would want to be doing. Number one on this list is the Sloan's Viperfish. As with most things on this list, we have a thoroughly disgusting looking creature. This thing is just as dangerous as it is disgusting though. The Twilight Zone says, like many of the inhabitants of the deep sea, Sloan's viperfish sport light producing organs called photophores along its body. These flashing blue, green or yellow lights might attract tasty snacks, but they're most useful for masking the fish's silhouette from predators below. They're also useful for grabbing a meal. When prey comes near, the viper fish drops a glowing light on its dorsal fin ray like a fishing lure in front of its mouth and snap. A muscular jaw filled with clear, sharp teeth comes crashing down like a guillotine. Lucky for the viper fish, its first vertebrae has evolved to act as a shock absorber for that powerful bite. This is the deep sea version of a piranha, except way more deadly. If you were getting attacked by piranhas, there would likely need to be multiple of them to attack you to actually win. I could totally see a world though where you lose one on one versus this thing though. Its teeth would literally dig so deep in your body. Even at the thickest part of your body, this thing has the potential to go all the way through if it bites you well enough. 
Thank goodness it's swimming thousands of meters below us and we don't need to worry about it popping up on our next snorkeling adventure. Number five, oarfish. Coming in at the number five spot is this terrifying 16 foot long monstrosity hauled out of the ocean by Chilean fishermen. Shocking those who learned, like me, that fish can be five meters long sometimes. The clip was posted to TikTok where it went viral almost immediately, sweeping up 10 million views pretty quickly. Most people worried this fish might be a bringer of bad times, and there might be an inkling of truth to that. This fish, called an oarfish, is thought in some cultures to be an omen of impending bad fortune. I mean, I understand it completely. If, if I picked this thing out of the water, I would not think that I had been blessed by good fortune. In Japanese folklore, this fish is sometimes referred to as Ryogo no Sukai, translating to the messenger from the sea god's palace, and I'm sure I butchered that pronunciation, I'm so very sorry. It's linked to the legend of Namazu, a giant sea snake which caused earthquakes whenever it would rise. Or fish live deep, deep, deep in the depths of the sea. And some scientists theorize that they only ever rise nearer to surface level whenever there's a disturbance in the tectonic plates, which would definitely make this fish a bad omen and a bringer of earthquakes. Now the actual ore fish, once you get aside all the legend, terrifying as it might look, is a bit of a gentle giant. It's the largest bony fish in the world, and it isn't much of a predator, preferring to swim around just hoovering up plankton. They barely even have teeth, to be honest, and they don't really pose a threat to humans. Unless you consider scaring the heck out of you a threat. You want to watch more scary sea creature videos? Well, I got great news for you because we have loads upon loads on the channel. Number four, green-eyed shark. Now, if the ocean is where all the scariest stuff in the world is hiding, that goes triple for any body of water around Australia, which is home to some of the actual most terrifying entities ever to walk the planet and swim the planet and fly the planet. It's where they send the animals that are too hardcore for the rest of the world. An Australian angler, Trapman Bermagee, pulled out this disgusting wretch of a fish some 2,000 feet beneath the sea. He captioned it, the face of a deep sea rough skinned shark. A little bit of a fake Australian accent there, I, I can't help it. Unsurprisingly, most commenters wanted to point out how disgusting the thing was, which is very similar to what I'm doing now. Now usually I'm a sucker for green eyes. But not on this leathery little monster. This thing looks like a baseball glove that came to life. I, I'm not having it. There's actually a lot of debate as to what this little thing is. Some commenters had suggested that it was a cookie cutter shark, which might sound adorable when you hear that. That sounds pretty cute, but I promise you it is not cute at all. A cookie cutter shark is named that because of its jagged mouth, which leaves cookie cutter like imprints on its victims, just like big holes in anything that it's biting at. However, the fisherman pointed out this wasn't a cookie cutter shark. A cookie cutter shark looks absolutely vile, but in a very different way. A cookie cutter shark looks more like a mole rat that was left in the sun for a few weeks, whereas this thing looks like it was grilled before ever being born. Now another commenter suggested that this shark could be something called an endeavor spur dog shark, which is a mouthful and a half. Now whatever the creature is, it goes without saying, I want very little to do with this shark. Number three, long-nosed chimera. Number three on this list is a kelp forest. Duct Tape Jedi writes, After a day of boat diving in Monterey Bay on the California coast, we had a night dive planned. I was there with two friends celebrating my birthday and we were part of a larger group of divers. My friends were too tired for the night dive and I was too, but I got invited to buddy with another diver whose friends also decided to stay on the boat. So I was following my new buddy through the kelp when some of it caught on my tank. I tried to pull clear but managed to get tangled even more to the point where I was unable to move. I kept shining my light around looking for my buddy but he was nowhere to be seen. After what seemed like an hour but was possibly just a few minutes, I felt some of the kelp loosen up and then saw that my buddy was cutting it off with a knife. I was so exhausted after struggling that when we got to the surface, he had to tow me back to the boat. So discovering a full on kelp forest, I mean that would honestly be really cool I think. Obviously what happened to our diver would have been incredibly scary though. Having to wrestle for over an hour or however long he was there for with some kelp in the dark, probably thinking that you're going to drown, doesn't sound great. But if you did discover a kelp forest and that didn't happen, then I think it'd be pretty sweet. If you're going to go though, then make sure you carry your own knife because you wouldn't want to end up like our friend here. Number two on this list is a body. This story is from Texas Guy 911 and he says, I was diving in a local pond with a group of much more advanced cave divers than I was. I'm leading the dive as to get used to the pressures and responsibilities of heading the procession and they're mentoring me. The known horrible visibility makes 
it impossible to navigate by compass, so we follow a line put by other divers. These lines go from one sunken item to another. So I know I'm about to hit a small sunken boat, but I don't remember which one. There are a few similar in a row in the same state of decay. I'm the first in the group, and I get to the boat, and I see someone's black army boots sticking out from the inner quarters. It looks somewhat new, not like items you find on the bottom. It's hard to see due to so much muck in the water. So I touch the boot, thinking it's by itself, but it won't lift, like it's attached to something heavy. I put my hand further in and feel the leg continuing out, pants, the calf, and now I see the second leg. I turn around and show a sign for the emergency ascend to the group behind me. Everyone has a sour face, nobody wants to go to the surface, but it's a rule that if one says up, others in the group must abort, no questions. They wanted me to explain with signs why, but what's a diver's sign for a corpse? I feel like I rush toward the surface, even though I'm trying to stay calm and take time. So we're on the lake's surface, I have this adrenaline rush, can't breathe enough. So I tell them there's a body down there. I see rolling eyes from everyone once they see I'm serious. I describe in detail what I saw and then we go down again. Once we locate it, we don't know if we should go forward or backward as there are several boats on the line and who knows in which boat the body is in and how far we drifted while taking it out on the surface. Well, we find all the boats before seeing the original one, of course. So our customary leader goes into the boat's cabin and we wait. I'd say he was rather courageous at this point. Then he emerges from the cloud of muck and tells us all to surface. So gluing information together from what we learned later on, it actually turns out the police or some other agency had body recovery training in the same lake the same day. When they went for lunch, they stuffed their fully dressed anatomically correct rubber doll in one of the sunken boats for a few hours for safe keeping. So that didn't turn out to be an actual body, but I still think this would have been super scary. To feel a leg and then another leg in the darkness of the water like that on one of your first dives, I mean that would be a lot. Maybe I'm just weak because deep sea diving is just not for me, but honestly that would have scarred me for potentially life, whether the body is real or not. Number one on this list is a survivor. Off the coast of Nigeria roughly eight years ago, a tugboat broke down and sank to the bottom of the ocean. Three whole days later, a diving crew went out to the wreckage to see what was down there and recover the dead bodies. It was thought that no one could have possibly survived the crash and that all 12 people on the boat were dead. That's why the crew was so shocked when they found someone had actually survived. Maybe this doesn't seem as scary as finding someone who had died, but we're lucky enough to have the actual clip of them recovering this person and just watch as the hand comes out. All right, you found one, yeah? He's alive, he's alive. He's alive. The startled dive team discovered the tugboat's cook had survived for three days. So that one image of having a hand reach out of the dark and stormy nothing would have actually terrified me. Not to mention that man who survived down there. That would have been three days by himself surviving in this tiny air pocket, most likely believing that the world has left you for dead. This is definitely one of those scary discoveries that's for the better, because someone's life was saved, but as the Reddit user Edgar writes, I can't imagine how creepy and unexpected it would be to be on a mission to recover the dead and have a hand reach out to you like it did. Number five, Siphon of Force. Now, what you're looking at right now definitely looks alien. It looks like something out of one of the Avatar movies. It looks like a giant sea serpent, right? What it actually is, is one long organism made up of countless individual creatures joined together called siphonophores. Now, siphonophores are some of the weirdest and most fascinating creatures in the ocean. They're a type of like colony. They're a living colony that consists of multiple individual creatures called zooids. Each one has their own specialized function and they all work together. Together. From their appearance and behavior, there's not really a lot of things like siphonophores out there. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but they all share a basic structural design. They consist of a long, slender stem, or like a stalk, with multiple branches or tentacles coming out of it. Each of these branches or tentacles is actually an individual little zooid, specialized for a particular task like feeding, swimming, or reproduction. Oh, everybody's jealous of the reproductive zooids. <laughs> Always a feeder. One of the most 
Interesting aspects of them though is how they eat actually. They're active predators and they use those long tentacles to capture small fish and like plankton and stuff. However, unlike a lot of predators, siphonophores don't just use their tentacles to capture their prey. What they do is they use these stinging cells called nematocysts, which are located on the surface of their tentacles to paralyze their prey. And once their prey is immobilized, tentacles coil around and bring it to the siphonophore's mouth, which is located at the base of the tentacles. And yep, you are definitely going to be thinking about that tonight when you try to go to sleep. Now, despite all these cool things I have told you, there's still so much we don't know about them because they're largely a mystery. They're difficult to study and understand, mostly because they're really far down deep in the ocean where we can't get at, and they're also extremely fragile. But boy, are they weird. And if you're looking for more strange stories about horrors under the water, well, this is part two, so you already know we've got plenty of videos on that, and oh my god, if you like the Megalodon, we've got a video or two for you. But if you don't want stuff from the ocean, we got just about anything scary you could think of. Click on through and subscribe, and make sure you hit that bell and don't miss a scream. But, whew. Slow down there, buddy. Do that at the end of this video, okay? I got way more weird sea creatures for you. Number four, the immortal jellyfish. We're all born to die, are we not? That's what Lana Del Rey said, and I trust her more than anyone. Well, us humans, maybe. But some of us are built different, like the immortal jellyfish. The immortal jellyfish is a fascinating and downright eerie creature that's got the attention of scientists and the public alike. This thing is tiny, it's only about five millimeters inside, it's found all over the world, and it has an incredibly unique ability to regenerate its cells and reverse its aging process, effectively making it immortal. So far, this is the only creature that's been shown to prestige once it hits max level. It's a little joke for my modern warfare. Fair friends. This means that the immortal jellyfish can genuinely live forever as long as it doesn't fall prey to predators. Pretty good deal. While the idea of immortality sounds like a dream, I mean that's like what half of like all science fiction stories are about is trying to make yourself immortal, the immortal jellyfish has raised concerns about the impact of its population growth on ecosystems. Because these things technically have the potential to live forever, it's got the ability to reproduce rapidly and take over the habitats of other species, disrupting the balance of marine ecosystems. This could lead to an extinction of other species, and who knows what kind of ripples that would have on the food chain. And even though they're pretty small, I think an army of immortal jellyfish are actually kind of scary. The scientists are studying the creature's unique ability to regenerate its cells and hope that maybe they can unlock the secrets of human aging and potentially develop new treatments. This definitely has the possibility to benefit humanity in many ways. It sure would be awesome to live to like 300, but it also raises a ton of ethical questions and who knows what that kind of technology or research could look like in the wrong hands. If you've ever played the video game Bioshock, I feel like you should already know a thing or two about the dangers of harvesting undersea creatures for their DNA to inject into humans, it did not work well for anybody in Rapture. It was terrible there. So maybe it's best we leave those cells inside the jellyfish. You wouldn't really expect anything horrifying to exist in Newfoundland. It's a very pleasant place. You think it's mostly just chips and Jig's dinner all the way down. Well, for Gary Goodyear, a fisherman out of Templeman, Newfoundland, he pulled this long-nosed chimera out of the water and gave himself quite the shock. His nets went some 2,000 feet down into the water where he unearthed this long beaked mystery fish. When he pulled it up, the crew could not believe what they had seen. It was not at all what they were expecting. I have to include this quote from one of the articles because it's just, it's too new fee not to include. Goodyear said, We're hauling away and by and by I seen this coming around the roller. I said, good god, what in the heck is that? Now when he first pulled it up, he wondered at first if it might have been a platypus because of the impressive snoot on the beast. He described this pelagic nightmare's beak as being very rubbery, like cartilage. No one on the boat had any idea what they had found, so they kept the body of the fish and took it to a local fishery in the hopes that someone could properly ID their mystery monster. Luckily, somebody actually knew and it got correctly identified as a long-nosed chimera, an ancient deep sea dwelling fish famous for its green eyes and, putting this gently, its monstrous appearance. The reason that its nose felt like cartilage is because the fish is completely cartilage from nose to tail. It's actually boneless. So this fish is a spineless coward. The creature most likely perished as it was being pulled up. An extreme pressure change from being 2,000 feet beneath the sea gave it a serious case of the bends. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise because I'm not sure I'd want to see this thing alive. I'm not sure I'd want to see it thrashing around on the floor of a commercial fishing boat. I think that wouldn't be good for anybody. Number two, decorator crab. 
Our next spot comes to us all the way from Thailand. Some local fishermen in Koh Yao Noi pulled up their nets while fishing for crabs and discovered they'd brought up an alien looking creature with them that mystified them. They couldn't identify this thing. Take a look at this creepy little crawly. Kind of looks like a spider that's got a good fashion sense, got really into accessorizing. But it almost kind of looks like it shouldn't be moving at all. Like it's just some garbage that got cursed into being alive or maybe some seaweed that developed sentience. The fishermen were understandably pretty puzzled by this thing, so they decided to post a video of the then unidentified critter hoping to get some answers, and for once, the internet was actually helpful. The creature was correctly identified as a decorator crab, which is not something I'd heard of before this video, but I am so glad I learned about it, and I am even happier that I can pass it on to you. A decorator crab gets its name for its habit of using whatever it can scavenge around its environment to make into camouflage from predators. Now the really cool thing is that they'll use literally anything they can find. Debris, garbage, They'll even use little bits of other animals in a gruesome manner, like fins or parts of a crab shell. If it can be attached to it in some way, a decorator crab will stick it to itself. They're covered in tiny Velcro-like hairs that allow them to attach their findings easily. I, I would love having that. It would save me so much time getting dressed. They've been recorded chewing on things like kelp or seaweed to break them down into more easily attachable accessories. Now most of the creatures on this list have been weird and scary and kind of look horrifying and I'm not gonna lie, the decorator crab kind of looks pretty scary too, but I absolutely adore the decorator crab. It is showing up every other creature in the ocean when it comes to outfits. I love the garbage costume. It's given camp in a very good way. This thing is like a crab lady gaga and I love it. Number one, ghost shark. Roman Fedortsov routinely entertains his 600,000 Instagram followers with pictures of all the strange creatures he fishes up while sailing around Murmansk, a port city in Russia. His Instagram is a treasure trove of scary undersea finds, and I absolutely recommend that you toss him a follow if you're into this sort of thing, as he's kind of the head honcho for it. This video could easily just have been five things that he fished out himself. He, like, nobody is pulling out weird things the way Roman is. But with so many to choose from, I had a tough time, but I landed on this here fish, sometimes called Frankenstein's fish. Due to the stitches all over its body looking like it's been sewn together from the bodies of several other fishes. It's also been referred to as a rat fish, a ghost shark, a spook fish, but officially they're known as ghost chimeras. I like that it's got nothing but scary nicknames. These things are bad news from teeth to tail. They have a spiny dorsal fin that's poisonous to the touch. It's got a mouth of rat-like teeth that helps it grind down anything it catches, crushing its prey in its jaws. Usually goes after things like crabs or prawns, so the rat teeth help pulverize the shells. These little things also have an inherent ability to detect the electric fields produced by other creatures, and I wish I knew even the littlest bit about biology because this fish sounds like it's magic. Fish also sounds overpowered, not gonna lie. Now I think it's a little treat. We ought to have a little slideshow at the end of just a bunch of Fedortsov's weirdest catches and I'll just react to them. Ready? Okay, here we go, lightning round. Who would make this? Why would a creature evolve like this? I guarantee you this thing looks cuter as sashimi. That, that is a face not even mother nature could love, if that even is a face. You know what, this one, I'm actually kinda coming around to. I wouldn't touch it, I wouldn't order it, but I kinda like it. Kicking off today's list, we have the sunken city of Dwarka. Until roughly 50 years ago, it was simply a legend, a story passed throughout the ages. The most famous legend about the lost city of Dwarka can be found in the ancient epic of Mahabharata. Dwarka, similar to Atlantis, is said to have sunk beneath the sea at some point in the distant past. According to the sacred scripture of Srimad Bhagavatam, the city of Dwarka was built in response to Jarasandha, the ruler of Mahabharata. Magadha, who was constantly attacking Mathura. To prevent further attacks on his clan, Lord Krishna decided to establish a separate city on India's western coast. The city quickly rose to prominence and began the unstoppable pivot of Lord Krishna's mission, housing thousands of people in approximately 900 palaces that were crafted out of silver, gold, and precious stones, along with being heavily fortified and could only be reached by ship. At the time, the city of Dwarka quickly became a talking point around the world, inspiring awe and wonder. According to the Mahabharata, 23rd and 34th stanzas, the city was inundated and submerged by the Arabian Sea on the day that Krishna departed the earth to join the spiritual world after 125 years, and this is when the Kali Age began. The ocean's deity reclaimed the land, sinking the lost city of Dwarka, but sparing Lord Krishna's palace. It is also said that the lost city of Dwarka was attacked by Vimana, 
a flying machine. The description of the fight encourages ancient alien theories, as it appears that it was fought with sophisticated technology and powerful weapons from orbit. The spacecraft launched an attack on the city using energy weaponry, which resembled a lightning strike to onlookers, and it was so devastating that much of the city lay in ruins following the attack. A marine scientist discovered remnants of an underwater civilization near the coast of Dwarka, the city that's still on land that is, in the 1970s, and in 2002, scientists discovered an extremely advanced civilization from the past lying untouched beneath the ocean's surface. With the help of sound matrix and image technology, along with sub-bottom profiling, marine scientists were able to find the exact location of the city, including some stone structures. The lost city of Dwarka was officially found 120 feet underwater in the Gulf of Cambay, Kambat, off the western coast of India. Thanks to carbon testing, it was established that the city is anywhere between 7,000 to 9,500 years old, and stretches out 7 to 8 kilometers long and 3 to 4 kilometers in width. The most fascinating, or creepy thing about this underwater city, depending on your point of view, is that all human remains are still intact. Ergo, the main reason it made its way to today's list. Look, I'm not a scuba diver, but I can't think I'd be too fond of swimming around casually, admiring, you know, architecture, and bam! perfectly preserved dead bodies. During the 2002 excavation of Dwarka, many mud vessels, temple bells, ancient ritualistic vessels, and you know, other artifacts were found, with the carbon dating indicating that they date back to roughly 7200 BC, otherwise known as the prehistoric period. At the time of this research, scientists also found that a massive man-made wall that's almost 2,000 feet tall that has since been unearthed during periods of low tide and can't be easily seen. Granted, they're still waiting on absolute results from some strange structures made of iron they weren't able to identify. Maybe they're from the aliens? In fourth place, we have the Antarctica sea spiders. Okay, I'll admit it now, this one might be on the list purely because of how much it made me jump while researching. Seriously, look at the photos of these things. Mm. Yeah, this reaction is genuine. If I get nightmares tonight, I'm blaming y'all, okay? Before we start talking specifically about the big guys, time to dive into exactly what sea spiders are. Sea spiders are marine arthropods of the Pantopoda order and belong to the Pycnogonida class. They're cosmopolitan, and well, to some of us that sounds like a fancy drink. It just means they're found in oceans around the world. Lucky for me. There's over 1,300 known species, and they have legs ranging from one millimeter to over 70 centimeters in length. And that's over two feet in length. Well, most of them are towards a smaller end of this range, that one qualify as terrifying now. Would it? Although sea spiders are not true spiders, or even arachnids, their traditional classification as chelicerates would place them closer to true spiders than to other well-known arthropod groups, such as insects or crustaceans if correct. Sea spiders tend to either walk along the bottom of the ocean with their stilt-like legs, or just swim above it using an umbrella pulsing motion. They're mostly carnivorous predators, or scavengers, that feed on sponges, polychytes, and bryozoans. Alright, time to talk specifically about the big guys. Those really long legs I mentioned a moment ago are everything to the Antarctic sea spider, since they're where its vital organs are kept, because it doesn't have much of a body. Its proboscis is also important, because that's what it uses to suck the insides out of worms, jellyfish, sponges, and other soft body prey. Sounds delicious, I guess? Right now, all I can picture is like that one scene from The Lion King where Timon and Pumbaa are sucking the insides out of squishy bugs, and I'm pretty sure Simba and I are having the exact same facial reaction. For my brain's sake, it's highly unlikely for most of us to ever come across one of the giant spiders, since they only live in the oceans around the polar regions. Gigantism has been observed in a number of other Arctic and Antarctic species, leading to biologists to consult a couple of theories that certain elements elements of the polar environment must be conducive to humongous body size. Over several hypotheses have been put forward, with some scientists claiming that large body size may have developed as an evolutionary trait to enable animals to withstand long periods of starvation during the winter, when resources tend to become, you know, scarce in the polar regions. While others have suggested that some of these species may be somehow descended from creatures that invaded the Arctic and Antarctic from the deep sea, where high rates of gigantism have also been recorded. However, a recent study lends support to an entirely different theory, which resolves around the availability of oxygen in the polar oceans, since oxygen is more soluble in cold water than warm water. It has been suggested that this high availability of oxygen, coupled with the fact that low temperatures slow animals' metabolism down and reduce their need for oxygen, could facilitate their gigantism. And hey, they're not venomous, so overall, they're not as dangerous. Uh, but that's not gonna stop my fears. Coming up next on the list is going to be the Baltic Sea Anomaly. 
anomaly. It's a very strange, unexplained object that was discovered in 2011 at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Now, this object is about 60 meters long and it's been described as a giant mushroom shaped stone, or maybe a crashed UFO, or some even think a sunken city. A UFO underwater. Does that make it an unexplained swimming object? A USO? Of course, there are some who think that the Baltic Sea anomaly could just be a natural formation formed from years of erosion, but that would be boring. Despite numerous attempts to study the anomaly and try and figure out just what it is, it remains a puzzle to scientists and a source of fascination. I mean, that's why we're still calling it the Baltic Sea anomaly, not the Baltic Sea we know what it is. Definitely the most scary thing about it is that it's completely shrouded in uncertainty. This thing was discovered by accident. You know, they weren't even looking for it. They were looking for shipwrecks and happened to find it. And since then, it has been the subject of constant speculation. Some, like I said before, believe that it could just be a natural formation, while others argue that this could be a shining piece of evidence towards an ancient civilization or even extraterrestrial life. There are some as well who are concerned that it could be a threat to the environment around it because there are some studies that have suggested that possibly the object could be leaking toxic chemicals or even, God forbid, radiation, which would have some pretty scary implications for the Baltic Sea and the people who live near its shores. As well, the fact that we know just like so little about this thing makes us wonder what could happen in the future. Could this be a Godzilla situation where this is a sleeping kaiju beneath the oceans that's going to come up and destroy a city? Probably not, but it could be. The Baltic Sea Anomaly, we may never find out a single thing about it. It's going to keep our imaginations going for years until we figure out just what it is. Who knows what dangers could be lurking. Could be nothing, but could be something. A reminder of how little we truly, truly know about what lies beneath the water. Number two, Sakoyam. What is the last thing you think you'd want to discover at the bottom of the ocean? Is it the Kraken? Cursed pirate treasure, a cavern full of misshapen skulls and bones. It's the last one. That's the only real one out of the three because that's our next point. This underwater cavern in particular, one Sakuyam, is located in the Yucatan. It's a sea note, and a sea note is a natural pit from the collapse of limestone bedrock that exposes groundwater underneath. And the Mayans sometimes used to use sea notes as places to perform like a little bit of human sacrifice, like just a little bit, like a teeny tiny little bit of human sacrifice. This sea note sits outside the ruins of the ancient Mayan city of Mayapan, south of the capital of Yucatan. It was a major political center from the 12th to 15th century and contained within its stone walls a secret Mayan city. Now there were around 40 sea notes which served as water sources for the residents and a pretty convenient place to store the misshapen bones of your human sacrifices. Legend says that this particular sea note is noteworthy for being guarded by a feathered horse-headed serpent. And when researchers dove in, they discovered there were very real reasons to be afraid. Bones scattered across the sea floors. 15 sets of bones marked by 15 bizarrely elongated skulls. These skulls were flattened during infancy. Um, why the Mayans did this is a bit puzzling to researchers and, and me. Uh, I don't know how much you know about like anatomy and biology, but traditionally, this skull works best when it's not flattened. Now, interestingly, researchers believe that these people weren't sacrificed, but rather their bones were laid to rest here to get closer to the underworld as they await the next cycle of rebirth. I only hope we didn't disturb them. I don't want to wake someone up while they're sleeping. And number one, the Yonaguni Monument. Now, you've definitely heard of the lost city of Atlantis, this mythical city that could have been signs of an ancient technologically advanced civilization that people believe sunk. But have you ever heard of the Yonaguni Monument? It's been called the Japanese Atlantis. It's a mysterious structure found off the coast of Japan that's quite puzzled scientists and researchers for decades. Some argue that it was crafted by an ancient civilization. Now, the monument itself is a sprawling complex of stone structures, steps and platforms, and the most defining feature is this massive pyramid that looms over it with precise angles and straight lines that make it seem like somebody engineered this thing rather than this thing just happened. It defies natural explanation. Many people believe that this monument was created by some unknown ancient civilization that's been completely lost to history. The design and precision of the stone suggests that it was crafted, crafted with care and skill, likely by a culture with technology a little more advanced than ours. If it's a conspiracy you prefer that aliens did it, then definitely it's a possibility that aliens built this thing. Now, others believe that the monument is simply a natural formation, and I can already hear 
hear you booing that has been shaped by the forces of erosion and tectonic activity as if you really believe in erosion. It's all a scam. They argue that the angles and straight lines are simply coincidental and the monument is nothing more than a curious formation. Sure. That's plausible, but it does feel like a bit of a cop out, and I just don't buy it personally. I'm usually more of a skeptic than not, but I have trouble believing that erosion and the passage of time could create something so strongly looking like a lost city. It would just be a very big cosmic coincidence, is all I'm saying. Now we know so little about the monument, and perhaps we never will, and that's just what makes it so interesting. So you let me know down below, what do you think the Yonaguni monument is? Something from an ancient culture, evidence of aliens on earth long before us, or just some rocks that happen to look like a temple?